339, please stand. 339, standing on the promises, all four verses. Offer it after this song. Yeah. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let His praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing. Standing on the promises of God, Next song is 499. I'm going to make you stand one more time because we're going to stand to sing Victory in Jesus. All three verses, 499. This is a stand-up song.
goodness. My goodness, I hope you're feeling good today. Is everybody all right today? All right, anybody got anything you want to cry about right quick before we get started? That's good, that's good, that's good. I didn't think so. I had so much fun last night, and I even slept good last night. How about that? I did, I had a great night. I hope you did too. I had so many of the folks that I got tickled. I got tickled at some point coming to me and saying, who is that over there? I don't know. Just go tell them thank you for being here. Well, we had a bunch of folks here that were from different uh, areas, and and uh, they just come right in and went right to work just like they was home folks, and that's the way I, I like it like that. I love it that way. I had several that told me, said, anytime you do one of these, now be sure and call me. I said, give me your number. <laughs> so, anyway, it was wonderful. Thank you. We are in the midst of our November month of Thanksgiving, right? You remember that, don't you? Yeah, we kicked that off last week, our month of Thanksgiving in November. You know, too many people are so quick to jump from the devil's, uh, the devil's celebration of All Hallows' Eve, which I despise, and then jump right straight into their watered-down, commercialized version of Christmas so they don't even think about Thanksgiving. We're going to think about Thanksgiving all month long, every Sunday. Last Sunday, we had a great service. We had a good time in it, too. And then today... We're going to be thankful again. Today, we're going to be thankful for our children. Thankful for our children, as all of you know in this church right now. That's my favorite subject. I love it. I love it. November, the month of November, today, we're thankful for our children. The, the kingdom of God, Jesus tells us, is our children. In 1 Chronicles chapter 29 and verse 10, 1 Chronicles 29 verse 10, in keeping with our Thanksgiving theme, wherefore, God, uh, wherefore David blessed the Lord before all the congregation. And David said, Blessed be thou, Lord God of Israel our Father, forever and ever. Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in the heaven and in the earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come of thee. And thou reignest over all. All in thine hand is power and might, and in thine hand it is to make great and to give strength unto all. Now, therefore, our God, we thank thee and praise thy glorious name. Let's pray. God, thank you. Thank you, O Lord. And may we ever be grateful all month, every month, every day. God, may we give thanks for your goodness, your wonderful, your majesty. Thank you for last night. Thank you for what this money is going to do to help folks in the Carolinas, God, just thank you for the privilege that you give us of being able to serve you and give you all the glory and the honor in Christ's name. Amen. How wonderful it is to be celebrating Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving, how we thank God and how we thank God for, for all that we, that we have. God abundantly blesses us. But you know, one of the things I give God a lot of thanks for, and I hope you do too, in our world today, in America today, we fuss and we grumble about all of this and we, you know, politics and all this other junk. But now listen, we need to every day thank God. Today, I thank God for those who served in our military, those who are serving today, those who served before Veterans Day tomorrow. Please be sure tonight, tomorrow, if you see a veteran, if you know a veteran, call them, thank them. Thank them for their service. I thank you if you're here today and and you're a veteran of any of our military branches. Thank you so much for having served. I thank God today for our veterans. I thank God for the personal opportunity that he's given me in this life I've lived. I thank God for every soul he's brought before me. Today, did you know that in America and worldwide, we have the opportunity to reach more people than anybody, any person, every group, every individual has ever had before. We have the opportunity today that has never been experienced on the face of this earth. I know, I know people, you know, a lot of them all messed up and so forth. But look, that's why God put us here. That's what the church is for, to hear, to make a difference, to help people, to help people realize the Lord God that we know and make sure that we let them see him through us. It's our responsibility to thank God for our future. And what is our future? You hold them in your lap this morning. We're trying to set up a nursery so we can serve them because we're getting more and more babies. Thank God for our babies. Thank God for our children. 
because they are our future. Without them, we, there is no future. I hear pastors, oftentimes we talk a lot among other pastors and so forth, and they'll say, well, our, our church is just dying off. You know, we just don't have any young people anymore. If we don't have children and young people growing up in our churches, in our communities, in our country, we don't have a future. We don't have a future. So we need to be taking that responsibility very, very seriously. The greatest mission field on earth is our children. The tender years, the tender years of their life are the best year to re years to reach them for Jesus Christ, to teach them, to mold them, to show them. Let them see. Too many people want to spend their life fussing and fuming and griping. And uh, Listen, don't let your children hear and see all of that all the time. Go ahead and show them real love, genuine love. Let them see the love of God and what David talked about. The greatness of the world is only because God has given it to us to enjoy the tender years. Think about this for a moment. How many of you got saved before you was 12 years old? I did. Some of you did too. How about before you were, say, under 25? You know what? Most people do get saved before they're 25 years old. In fact, after you reach 25, it gets difficult. And after 50, it gets almost impossible. If you've got children in your household, especially if God has given you the joy and the, and the, and the opportunity to have children in your household, you better hear me now. And you better hear me good, because I'm telling you, the Lord God Almighty, who will judge all souls and all men and women, God is going to personally hold you responsible as to whether or not you have exposed them and shown them Jesus Christ. And if you're neglecting that, there will be judgment to face. Listen to me carefully. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 18, verse 1, At the same time, the disciples came unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? These boys had been fussing. Now, we're talking about the disciples. Yes, the apostles, the 12 who followed him closely, sat around the supper table arguing over who's going to get to sit next to Jesus in heaven. Wanting to know who's going to be the greatest. They had argued with one another. John said, I will. You thought, oh, John. Yeah, he was one of the closest ones to Jesus on earth. Wait a minute. Him and Luke was fussing. Luke, yeah, the physician, Luke. They had been fussing over who was going to get to sit next to Jesus in the kingdom. They were fussing about that of all things. And so here they were asking Jesus, all right, Jesus, settle this argument for me. Settle this argument. Tell us, who's going to be the greatest when we get to heaven? Is it going to be me? Is it going to be Peter? Is it going to be some of these other guys sitting around? Listen, Jesus answered their question. I want you to hear it. Jesus called unto him, what? A little child. And he set him in the midst of them. And he said, listen. Verily, verily. What he says verily means, listen carefully. I say unto you, except you become converted or you be converted, and as you come as little children, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoso shall receive one such little child in my name receiveth me. But whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me. It were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were drowned in the depths of the sea. That comes from Jesus, not from me. Jesus said it. Now there's a vast difference between being childish and reaching, touching, being like a child. Nothing made Jesus, nothing made Jesus more angry in the Bible than when someone came between him and a child. Jesus said to those disciples in a very strong voice and a stern look on his face one day, he said, suffer the little children to come unto me, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. Jesus let them know right quick, boys, you're messing on my fighting side if you're keeping children away from me. All the disciples had done was said, tell the little children to go over and sit down and shut up. That's basically what they said. Get those little children out of the way so Jesus can teach the adults. Jesus said, oh, you better not. You better bring them children over here because I want to talk to them. Jesus blessed the children, the Bible said. Jesus blessed the children. The first healing miracle that Jesus ever performed on this earth was what? The healing of a child. He raised three people from the dead recorded in the scripture. Two of them were children. One was an adult. Jesus had a heart, has a heart 
for children. After the resurrection, Jesus talked to Peter. You remember that? Peter who denied him three times. Peter was one of the first ones that Jesus wanted to talk to. And he went over to Peter and he said, Peter, do you love me? Peter said, oh yeah, Jesus, you know I do. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Peter, do you love me? Oh, Lord, you know I love it. Feed my lambs. Three times Peter asked him, or Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? Three times Peter said yes. Twice Jesus said, feed my lambs. One time he said, feed my sheep. What is Jesus telling us? Jesus is telling us, my heart is my children. My heart is my babies. And if you're in any way, shape, or form, in any way, listen carefully. If I never get to tell you this again, you let it ring and echo through your brain. If you are hindering today a child from knowing Jesus, from coming to Jesus, from being in Sunday school to hear Jesus taught, from being in worship service to hear Jesus being preached, God is going to judge you personally in the day of judgment, and you don't want to hear what he's going to have to say. Jesus, to us adults today, God is saying, bring my children to me. Bring my children to me. God have mercy on anybody who will molest or abuse a child. God have mercy. I just as soon take them as soon as they even think about doing it and throwing them to the depths of the sea. But you know what Jesus said? Listen to me. Jesus said, child Tenderers in his eyes are child molesters. That's tough, folks. That's tough. It's serious. It's serious. I had a child one time, and I, I've, I've never forgotten it. My heart still breaks when I think about it. Come to me one day in vacation Bible school many years ago when we were still in the old church. And that child came to me and said, Brother Mike, who is Jesus? And I talked to her. I loved on her. And I told her in the best way I knew how, even as a young pastor, about Jesus and who he was to me and how much I loved him and how much I felt his love and how much he loved her. And that child that day fell in love with Jesus. She could not wait to go home and see her mom and daddy and tell her mom and daddy, hey, mama and daddy, I want to tell you about my Jesus I accepted him today as my Savior, and I love him. And they looked at me with anger in their face and said, you ain't going back to Bible school. You don't know how that felt. I was so excited. I just knew that they were going to be excited too. They never brought her back. They never brought her to Sunday school. They never brought her to worship service. And I'm not going to finish the story because you don't want to hear it. It's a story that will break your heart like mine, how that child turned out, the struggles, the horrible struggles she's gone through in her life. I know she still loves Jesus. She and I have talked many times. She still does love Jesus. But she's fought all of her life with the problems that she had because of the rejection of her parents over that day. Let me tell you something. Life is short. Eternity is long. Oh, so long. How in the world could you ever deprive your child? The child you know you love. How could you ever deprive that child from knowing the Jesus? The only thing that can keep them from spending their eternity in the place called hell. So important to Jesus that he spoke of hell three times more than he talked about heaven. How we need to be convicted in our soul today down to the depths of who we are. Nothing should ever hinder you from having your child in the place where he can learn, she can learn about the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Oh, I know we're all concerned about a lot of things. I've heard people, oh boy, if Trump don't win, we're going to hell. If, if Kamala don't win, he's going to take away our freedoms. What about that baby of yours? What about that child of yours? How many times have you cried out before God for their soul, for them to know Jesus and to be saved, to come to Christ and to know him and to be able to know in your soul that they are heaven bound, a child of God with God's power and God's blessing. Jesus blessed the children. God blessed people who bring their children to Christ. Oh, oh it, it, it called, preachers always asking for money. I don't care if you never give a dime to this church. God's going to take care of his church. Amen. Are you with me? The only reason we even allow you to give to this church for the Lord is because it's for your sake. It's for your blessing, for your privilege. Let me assure you of one thing that you can know from the depths of your toes to the top of your head. Satan spares no expense to destroy the soul of that child that you love and are raising in your home right now. He spares no expense. He stops at nothing to try and send their souls into an eternal hell because that's where he knows he's going to be. Never, ever, ever let us ever, for any reason that we can even come up with, ever withhold our child from knowing the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this is not a fire and brimstone sermon. This is a millstone sermon. Jesus said you'd be better off dead than you would be to face what you're going to have to face if you withhold your child from the teaching and the learning of the Lord Jesus Christ. Get it. I didn't say it. He did. Never let anything. Oh, I know we have a lot of good things in our lives. We let a lot of good things get in the way. Oh, all right. Anybody got any rotten tomatoes in you? All right. If you have, don't throw them at me. All right. But get this. We do all this money spending. We do all this time spending, running around, taking our kids to every baseball game, every football game, every soccer game, every karate game, whatever that is, gymnastics and <laughs> all this other stuff. Good stuff. Nothing wrong with it. But good stuff should never get in the way of the greatest thing of all. And that is to have your child where Jesus is taught and where Jesus is proclaimed. Your first energy, your first money, your first moment of life and everyone thereafter ought to be focused on making sure that your child gets to know Jesus Christ. Why is it so important when they're young? What did I tell you? More than 75%, maybe even 80% of the people who get saved get saved before they're 20 years old. Why is it so important? If they don't learn while they're at home with you in their mailable years, let me tell you, they may never get saved. How would you like to see the eyes of that child that you loved in this earth look into your eyes and say, you're the reason I'm here in this torment. You're the reason I'm here, that this body of man will not be consumed. It will eternally and forever suffer in these flames. I've been there. Oh, I've never been to hell but I've had the flames. I've been able to see with my own eyes the nerves in my arms and legs where the fire has burned away the flesh. I've been able to feel firsthand. Do you know how it feels when you have your toothache, when you have a nerve exposed in there? Do you know how that feels? Imagine if you had those nerves all over your body. Constantly screaming, never stopping, never ceasing, never getting any better, never being consumed. Please, God, just let me cease to exist. No, that won't happen. Before a person is cast into that place called hell, that body will be made in such a way. You can take a piece of asbestos and lay it on top of a torch. 
And it'll lay there and turn red and whatever, but it will not be consumed. It'll still be there. That's the way the body will be in hell. I've seen it on my own body. I've felt it, but that's nothing like. I mean, I was burned 70%. In hell, it'll be 100%. But there'll be no relief. There'll be no relief. The next time you hold that child in your arms or the next time you dry their tears because they skinned their knee or, or sprung their ankle, they're hurting, yeah. The next time they burn their finger, remember, that finger hurts, but it's just a sample of how they'll feel all over when they fall into that place of hell and torment for eternity because you didn't see to it, they learned about Jesus. The only, the only way to avoid hell. Put your time, put your energy, put your influence, put your money, wherever, whatever you got to do, into making sure that child comes to know Christ. How do I do all that, preacher? Well, first of all, love them. Love them yourself. Love them enough that they know it. Make sure they know it. Make sure they hear it. I'm a man. I'm a man as much as any man in here. Many of you are stronger than I am, and some of you are a whole lot stronger constitutionally and mentally than I am. But let me tell you something. I love to tell people, men, women, and children, but especially children, how much I love them. I love to share the love of Jesus with anyone who loves to hear it. And let me tell you something. Nobody loves to hear I love you better than a child. No one. Give your children love. Right now, while they're children, they're hungry for love more than they'll ever be for the rest of their life. They will listen to you. They will know. Nobody on earth knows whether or not the love is genuine better than a child does. A child knows when somebody really means it, when they say they love them. They know. They need your love. They need to know your love. And children, children will give you love, whether you deserve it or not. Children will love their parents, even if their parents are as sorry, sorry as gully dirt. They'll love them anyway. They'll love them anyway. They will continue to love you, even when you mistreat them. Even when you don't take them to Sunday school and you doom their poor souls to hell, they'll love you anyway. All they want is your love back again. Oh, they want a bicycle. Sure they do. But they don't want anything like they love, or want your love. They need to know Jesus' love. You love them and you let them know what real love is. You show it to them. Whether they act like they want it or not, even when they misbehave, make sure that even if you have to discipline, you still, you love them. And that's the reason you do what you do and measure it accordingly. They need to know Jesus' love. Where are they going to find it? They're going to start finding it if they find it in mom and daddy, in uncle and aunt, in grandma and granddaddy. They need to find that love of Jesus first when they find it through you. We need to tell them that we love them and we need to teach them that Jesus loves them too. Kids have an enthusiasm in their life more than they'll ever have the rest of their lives. Everything is new. Everything's exciting. Everything's just wow. Abby, don't get mad at me, but Abby brought her boys down there with digging taters. And let me tell you something about those boys. <laughs> they find them old taters about that big. Man, they'd get excited. But you know what else? They'd find one about as big as the end of your finger, and they're just as excited. Boy, I found one. Mama, here. And they'd put it in the basket. One of them come up there and had a worm in one hand and a tater in the other one. And boy, he couldn't decide which one to put in the basket first. I love it. I love it. Children learn that way. They learn that way. They are excited. They're excited about life. They love to come to church. I know. You look at me and say, oh, preacher, they don't want to come. They don't want to come. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, they do. Oh, yeah, they do. And you make sure they know that church is a place where they could be happy. You show them happy. Don't you come to church with a big old sour look on your face. Don't you come in here and sit down and look over and 
Uh, I'm, I'm going to use David because I know he won't get mad at it. So when I look at old David Richardson, and in your face, it's like an old mule. You know, you read this room like him. He said something the other day I didn't like. He probably didn't even know he said it. Come to church. You let them see enthusiasm in you. Let them see you loving Jesus and loving God's people. Don't you let them hear you go home and fry the preacher for lunch. You let them hear you go home and talk about what he talked about in the sermon that was good for them. You let them hear you tell them how you love God and show them how you love God by getting on your knees in prayer and praying for them to the only God that can save them. Get on your face before Jesus and let them see you loving Jesus. Wouldn't it be wonderful? One old preacher thought he'd be cute one day. He went to the football game. The local team, boy, the high school team, they winning them all. Man, we're going to win the state championship. And he sat by this lady, and man, I'm telling you, she's from his church. And, oh, she couldn't sit there. She just kept jumping up. Yay, way to go. Way to go, you know, and running up and down the sideline. She was all excited. Come halftime. She finally sat down, and while she was sipping on her drink, preachers thought he'd be real cute. He looked over and said, said boy, wouldn't it be nice if you got that excited when you came to church? She said, well, if you'd be as enthusiastic about what you're doing as they are out there with what they're doing, I might get that excited. <laughs> okay, preacher, that's me. I got it. Childlike enthusiasm. Catch it yourself and then give it back to them in the form of love and excitement about what's going on in their lives. Let them know you really care about what's happening with them in school that you really care about their relationship with their teachers, that you care about what their grades are, more so than just so you can give them a good beating if they make a bad one. Come on. Let's get excited with them. Love them that way. And let them know that God is the same way. God is more loving and more exciting than you are. Give your kids love. Give them joy. Give them joy, the joy of Jesus. 542 times in the Bible, it talks about the joy we have in God. Have that joy. And let your children see that joy. The Bible tells us the joy of the Lord is your strength. What does that mean? That means, man, I get up in the morning, I'm ready to go. Why? I got the joy of the Lord in my heart. What's that old song? I got the joy, joy, joy. You know that song, down in my heart. Let it be seen. Let those children, let them catch it. Show them how to have it. You know, we kind of, I grew up, my mama, my grandma raised me. God bless her soul. We were going to church. We didn't do nothing else. We were going to church, and we'd go to church. And I had to behave in church. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. I had to behave in church. <laughs> but I've seen folks, you know, think, I saw a little child one day, and I'm not going to tell you if it's here or somewhere else. So y'all just don't even try to figure out who it was. But that little child was standing up in the seat. Now, we in the school bus, you know, you're wasting your breath if you're telling that kid to turn around, Okay. And that kid was just all over, just, just looking at everybody. Anybody that would look at him, boy, just grinning at him, just grinning, having a big old time and loving it all. And finally, Mama realized what he was doing, grabbed him, plopped him down in the seat. Now, you sit there and be quiet. But you sit there, don't you? He wasn't hurting anybody. We need to teach our children church is the happiest place on earth. Oh, I don't mean disrupting service. Don't get me wrong. But they ought to learn that, that you're happiest when you're in church. You're happiest when you're with God's people as well as your home family. Make sure they know, they know that they see it in you. They learn from you more than they will anybody else on the face of this earth. Oh, listen, I want to tell children, and I want you to help me do it. Tell our children, Jesus Christ is the one who understands them better than even I do. Even better than their parents does. He's with them everywhere they go, everything they do. That God loves them. God loves to see a kid smiling in church. God loves to see a kid interacting with other people and enjoying the far out of it. And I do too. Even curious little children that, you know, every once in a while they think they really need to get out and run around a little bit. Don't turn them loose and let them run around. But do help them to learn. To learn what is best. That's God. To me, God loves your children. Do you love them? Do you love them? The only sign that our civilization has any home has any hope left. The only sign that our 
America has any hope left. They're sitting in here with us today, our babies, our children. And with them goes or comes whatever hope we're going to have. Bring them. Jesus said, bring the little children unto me. And he blessed them. Here, I promise you they will not be hindered from learning about Jesus. They will not be hindered because they're going to hear. They're going to hear. They will not be hurt. We will do nothing to hurt your children in any way, shape, or form. We will love them the same as you do. Here. Here is God's fortress. Here. Here is God's safe place. You ever play hide and seek? And then you could run and you get on base right quick so you'd be safe. Here's that base. You wouldn't, you wouldn't even start to understand all the little children's faces I've looked at at this church. This is the only place they felt safe. We had picked up a many a young in that old church bus and brought them up here. And they would be so relieved to be here. Because they could smile, they could laugh, they could play, they could have fun and not be hurting. The sorrow of the world is outside of these walls. Bring them. All the way from the nursery to the exit out the door when they get grown and go to college. We're going to love them. I'll promise you here they'll find joy, they'll find peace, they'll find love. They'll find somebody that'll get excited with them and laugh with them and smile with them. I promise you that in this place, your child will leave here with the seed of Jesus' love planted in their heart because they will have felt genuine love here. They'll see the presence of Jesus Christ. Will you pray with me? God, I happen to know that there's a lot of parents, grandparents, Aunts and uncles sitting in this room right now. And all of us, God, every last one, we need a reminder to be thankful. Thankful for our children. We live in a world, God, of hatred. A world where people can't wait to fuss and hurt one another. Oh, God, help us to teach our children that this is a world where they can find love and peace and joy through Jesus Christ and mom and dad and their families, they can be safe. And then, God, that they can grow up to teach their children the same way. Help us, God, to be convicted to our souls right now of the need to bring our children unto you. Thank you, Lord, for what I know you're doing right now. And thank you, Lord, for the children. In our month of thanksgiving, God, today we lift up our children to thank you. Thank you for the blessing, for the opportunity, for the joy of being able to have them in our lives. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Amen. Today we have baptizing. Will, if you want to go on back and start getting ready. I'm so thankful just a couple of weeks ago, or not quite that long, Will and I was in the shop and just kind of talking about things, and we got to talking about the Lord. And Will expressed his desire to know Jesus. So we talked about it some more, and then finally he prayed to receive Christ into his life. And he came, made that public the other Sunday. And so thank you, Lord, for that. Be praying for him. Pray for our church as we minister to him and we do our dead level best to be God's family to him. Melissa. Okay, let's get our hymn books. Turn to 603. 603, when we all get to heaven.
right over to 604, 604. Shall we gather at the river? over one page, 605, we'll just kind of roll through them, <laughs> 605, and sweet by and by. There's a land that is fairer than day, and by faith we can see
if you'll turn to 611, 611 on Jordan Stormy Banks. to 618, 618, I've got peace like a river. Sure. 